This story truly infuriates me. This woman was forced to marry this man and only a few weeks later, she was found murdered. This is about 20-year-old Rukia Hadari who moved from Afghanistan to Australia with her family at a very young age. In 2019, Rukia was forced by her mother to marry 25-year-old Muhammad Ali only two weeks after her mom introduced them. Leading up to the wedding day in November, Rukia was going around telling her friends, teachers, and counselors that she did not want to go through with the wedding but had no choice because her mom told her that she had to do it. Before their wedding day, Rukia and Mohammed had only seen each other a few times and during the ceremony, it's clear that she does not look happy or excited at all. After their ceremony, Rukia moved across the country to live with Mohammed, leaving her friends and family behind and things quickly took a turn. Only six weeks after their wedding, Rukia's life was savagely taken by Mohammed after he got upset said that she was not cooking or cleaning for him. He even took this video moments before he took her life and sent it to her family to try to embarrass her. Mohammed slit her throat with a kitchen knife and then he called her brother to let him know what he did and then he turned himself in. But here's the twist. Not only was Mohammed charged with murder and sentenced to life in prison, Rukia's mother was also found guilty and was the first person in Australia to be convicted of causing a person to enter into a forced marriage. This picture famously surfaced from 1941 because something looks very off about it. This guy, a lot of people cite this picture as proof of time travel because not only does he seemingly look very modern and out of place, but he also appears to be holding a camera that's very small, too small for any commercial grade camera of 1941. But let me explain why this is debunked. The modern t-shirt he's wearing, it's a logo for the Montreal Maroons, which was a hockey team from the 40s. The glasses were also available, they had protective side shields in the 40s too. But what about that camera? It's small enough to be a digital camera, but they did not have commercial grade cameras that were this small in the 40s. Incorrect. Kodak confirmed of a rare model of a small portable camera that was limited, but it was available by 1941, which makes this photo completely plausible. So I'm obsessed with the dark side of Disney. And did you know there's a horrible period of accidents at Disneyland that doesn't really get talked about a lot? It's been referred to as the Disney Dark Ages. It was from 1997 to 2003 when this guy, Paul Pressler, was the president of Disneyland. Paul basically decided they were no longer gonna do scheduled maintenance on rides. They were only going to fix rides when they were broken. Did it save money? Sure. But this resulted in some of the worst accidents the park had ever seen. One of the worst being that of Brandon Zucker. In 2001, Brandon Zucker was on the Roger Rabbit ride, which was already having maintenance issues. An employee put Brandon on the wrong side of the car and when he put the lap band down, it didn't close all the way. So at one point in the ride, Brandon tumbled out of his seat and was hit by an oncoming car. The car pinned him and dragged him down the track before anyone could do anything. Also, at the time, Disney employees were not allowed to call 911. They had to call park emergency services, who then called 911. So it took a while for anyone to come get Brandon. He did survive the accident, but he had brain damage so bad, he was nonverbal and lost a lot of motor skills for the rest of his life. And eventually he passed away at 13 years old. The FBI suspects a serial killer works as a trucker to find victims and then dispose of their bodies across state lines to confuse police. And that's what they think happened to Tammy Jo Zawicki. This college student was driving from Evanston, Indiana to Grinnell, Iowa when her car broke down in Illinois. Yet her body was found nine days later across I-44 in Missouri. She was last seen on August 23, 1992, standing near her broken down car at mile marker 83 on I-80 and there was a semi-truck with a rusty orange stripe parked near her car. It seems like he was trying to help her, but the FBI thinks he was waiting to grab her. Tammy's body was found on a rural stretch of I-44 in southwestern Missouri. She was wrapped in a red blanket and surrounded by duct tape. She'd been stabbed once in the arm and seven times in a circle around her heart. According to the FBI, she'd also been essayed. Witnesses described the driver of the tractor trailer being a white male, 35 to 40, six feet tall, and with bushy dark hair. The trucker she was last seen alive with has not been identified. Illinois investigators think this could be a trucker by the name of Lonnie Beardrot. He matched the description at the time and his trailer home is near where her body was found. And Tammy's body was found wrapped in a blanket with the Kenworth logo and Lonnie drove a Kenworth truck. But to be fair, Kenworth is a large manufacturer. Lonnie Beardrot died, but he isn't the only suspect. Because of the interstate connection, this person could be from almost anywhere. Several other serial killers' names have been brought up in connection to Tammy's case, but as of right now, it's unsolved.
Let me know if you want to hear more about highway serial killers and their possible victims. And follow if you like true crime. Ancient Discoveries, Part 2. After a Chinese construction company caused the reservoir to sink 10 feet, a 600-year-old Buddha carving was uncovered. Underwater archaeologists even found evidence of an ancient temple beneath the 12-foot statue. This ancient sapphire ring is believed to have belonged to Caligula, the third emperor of Rome. It includes an engraved portrait of his fourth and final wife, Sasonia. Here's the before and after of an ancient Greek stadium found in modern-day Turkey. It was built around the 1st century AD and once held a capacity of 30,000 people. The Orkney Hood was found in a Scottish peat bog in 1867. Despite its immaculate condition, the garment is around 1,500 years old. 1,600-year-old sling bullets from ancient Rome have been found with the words Take That inscribed on them. Often considered the Sistine Chapel of Ancient Egypt, this is the 3200-year-old tomb of Queen Nefertari. The paintings are said to be the best preserved and most detailed decorations of any Egyptian burial site by far. This woman was caught putting Roundup in her husband's Mountain Dew. This man from Missouri went to police after his home surveillance camera caught his wife, 47-year-old Michelle Peters, pouring Roundup, which is a chemical weed killer, into his favorite drink. He became a little suspicious in the beginning of May when he noticed that his Mountain Dew was tasting a little off. At first, he ignored the strange taste and continued to drink it, but a couple of weeks later, he began vomiting and having a sore throat. Then on June 12, he reviewed surveillance footage in his garage where he kept his Mountain Dew in a fridge. And it shows his wife pouring the Roundup straight into the Mountain Dew bottle. Around that same time, he had told her that he was feeling sick and all she said was that he probably had COVID and to stay away from the grandkids. Eventually, he went to police and Michelle was arrested and at first, her defense was that she mixed the Mountain Dew with the Roundup because she wanted to create this strong weed killer and she had seen this on Pinterest. But eventually, she admitted to everything and she said she did it because she was mad at her husband for being unappreciative after she threw him a 50th birthday party. She then expressed that she regretted it and she should have just divorced him. She was charged with first degree domestic assault and armed criminal action. Imagine if your grandparents just disappeared, like completely without a trace. Welcome to Creep Time on TikTok with Silas Dean. This is the haunting story of Charles and Catherine Romer. On April 8th of 1980, a wealthy elderly couple named Charles and Catherine check in to a Holiday Inn right off I-95. They're just on their way home from a vacation. But to put this in context, this wasn't a usual choice for them. These were two very well-off people, so to choose a Holiday Inn, it wouldn't have been typical of them. But not long after checking into their room, the couple seemingly vanished. After two or three days, hotel management became concerned that they hadn't seen the couple leave their room, so they went to go check on them. This was only to find that their room had never been slept in. Inside the room were all of their clothes, their travel diary, and over $60,000 of Catherine's jewelry. Hotel staff then goes out to the parking lot and finds that their car is missing, but no one ever saw them leave. At the time, only one witness comes forward saying that they saw this car miles away at a restaurant circuit, but after they interviewed people at the restaurant, nobody remembered seeing this couple. Despite search efforts, they were never found after that night, and no one really knows what happened to them. In 1988, the entire classroom of students disappeared. Today, 40 years later, an elderly woman recounted the chilling truth. Sophie Reed arrived at the police station claiming she knew the truth behind the disappearance of an entire classroom of students in 1988. The police were astonished because this mystery had haunted the country for 40 years. Sophie began her account. It was a clear Tuesday in April 1988 when Mr. Hemington led his students into the woods for a geography lesson. Suddenly, at 3 o'clock as the bell chimed, Mr. Hemington and the children mysteriously vanished. The principal immediately alerted the police, and more officers and parents joined the search, but they found no trace of them. This event gradually evolved into an inexplicable mystery, becoming an unsolvable nightmare. Sophie then revealed a startling secret that left the police present in shock. Police officers thought that crimes like this only happened in movies. In the next part, I will show the interview with the missing teacher, so press the plus button and comment teacher for more details in part two.
Let's talk about this couple who cheated on the show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and thought they got away with it. You just want one minute! This all happened in 2001 when Charles Ingram was a contestant on the show while his wife Diana and a man named Tequan Whitcock were in the audience helping him cheat the entire time. So how exactly did they notice that Charles was cheating? Well, throughout the entire show, the sound technician noticed a loud coughing coming from the audience at specific times after Charles spoke. I don't think it's an animal. Megatron, mega, 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 yeah. I don't think it's Megatron. I'm sure it's Google. <laughs> After reviewing the footage, they noticed that the coughing came specifically from Tequin and Diana whenever Charles mentioned the right answer after the four options. They were able to catch a total of 19 coughs, which came from his wife and Tequin, which signaled the correct answers. But not only that, Charles' strategy throughout the game was very odd because he would state the four options out loud and it was clear that he didn't know the answer, but somehow he always got it right. Then what producers found strange was that after Charles got every question right and won 1 million pounds, he was seen arguing with his wife backstage. By the time Charles left the set, they began investigating and they did not hand over the money to him. All three of them were found guilty of conspiring to cheat, but till this day, they've maintained their innocence and Tequin still argues that his coughing was because he had allergies and it was all a coincidence. Ultimately, if Charles didn't cheat, he would have only won a thousand pounds that night. This is a good reminder to double check every single nook and cranny in your house. Because in 2019, this couple came home after a week-long vacation to see that there was a stranger living in their home. And he had most likely been living there while they were also in the house. Also, if you like these kinds of stories, you'll like tonight's episode. Upon arriving home after a week away, Josh Campbell tried the front door of his house, but there was a stranger on the inside pulling it closed. That stranger was 26-year-old Ezekiel Zayas, and yes, this is a video he left on their personal computers. The two were able to call the police and eventually get him out of the house, but that's when they saw all of the terrifying stuff he had been up to in the home. He also left them videos on their computers that included incredibly personal information that they had only shared with each other, meaning that he had been listening to their conversations. But the worst part was the knives. Ezekiel had left notes in the house about surgeries that he wanted to perform on the family, like a hand transplant, and when the couple went into their bedroom, they saw that there were knives and other utensils all around the bed. It seemed like he was preparing to do some sort of operation on them. Frogging stories are absolutely terrifying, and I don't want to give too much away, but you might be spooked by tonight's episode. Do you ever see a picture that just makes your stomach drop? This is a still from an alert that a woman named Alexis Randall got on her phone. It's from a security camera that was set up in her living room, but she's looking at this and she's thinking the same thing you are. She's like, what's wrong with the picture here? Why did the motion detector go off? But then look a bit closer, specifically at the bathroom door. This man who was staring at the camera from the door she spots this picture and she immediately panics and calls the police, but by the time they get there, this guy is gone. What really freaked her out even more is that when police got there, they found evidence that the bathroom window had been tampered with. Further security footage would show that the man had crawled through the bathroom window the night before and was hiding in the hallway bathroom all through the night, even while she was in the house. And if you guys are loving creep time, make sure to go follow on Insta. This is one of the most terrifying urban legends I've ever heard. And it ended up being true. But in Canada, there was this legend that one night a bunch of people saw a bright blue light in the sky and the next day an entire village of people disappeared. But it turns out that legend is rooted in something that really happened. This is coming from this week's episode. I have a whole series on urban legends that ended up being true and it's a very scary listen. So in Canada in 1930, a fur trapper named Joe LaBelle was riding in the river in his canoe when he came to a village he had seen before. Except this time when he came upon it, it looked like everyone had left in a hurry. Food was still cooking and a bunch of dogs were barking and super hungry as if they had been left behind. But the strangest part of all of this was in the middle of the community, there was a grave that had been disturbed. And that reminded the fur trapper of a very scary story he had heard. The legend of the torn rack, which was this demon that supposedly stalked the area. So he starts looking for someone who might know what happened to these people. They were a nomadic people. It didn't make any sense that they would have left all of their stuff behind. And that's when he finds a man in a hospital who was potentially part of the village. The man is so freaked out. He won't say anything at first, but eventually Joe gets him to talk and he recognizes one word that the man says. 
Tornrak, the name of the evil deity that was potentially in the area. The police basically don't believe any of this, but they do acknowledge that before the disappearance, they did see blue lights in the sky that no one has been able to figure out what they were. I get more into the theories of what may have happened in this episode, and I also talk a little bit more about other urban legends that ended up being true. Terrifying Cursed Objects That Will Haunt Your Dreams, Part 1, Robert the Doll. According to legend, in the early 1900s, a wealthy American family known as the Ottos committed an unspeakable offense against their young maid from the Bahamas. In an act of retaliation, the maid gifted the young Otto boy, Eugene, a doll named Robert, which had been cursed by a voodoo priestess. In the following years, Eugene would become uncomfortably close to the doll, speaking to it as if it were a real person, and becoming violently angry with anyone who looked at it without his permission, claiming that they were being disrespectful to Robert. In addition, most of the Otto family friends stopped visiting, claiming to have seen the doll move by itself, or having heard it giggling late at night. Eventually, the Otto family sent the doll to a museum to get rid of it, where it remains to this day. Thousands of people have attributed tragedies that have occurred in their life to having visited Robert the Doll, and it is said that if you view it without its permission, misfortune will find you as well. Tag a friend to pass the curse along and follow for more. Do you know, or did you know a young lady by the name of Diane Ruiz? Yes, that was my mom. And... Is there anything that you would like for the jury to consider um, here today as it relates to this matter? Um, I wrote a letter. Can you please be so kind? Um, my name is Zay Romero. I'm a 19-year-old college student going for my bachelor degree in graphic design. I'm Diane Ruiz's youngest child. I'm, I was only 14 years old when she passed. Just starting my freshman year of high school, she was so excited um, to see me grow up. And so proud of what I was growing into, she supported me in all my dreams and only tried to help and uplift me when taking on new risks and challenges. My father unfortunately passed away when I was only 11 years old. My mother was all I had left. I was barely two months into my first year of high school when she passed away. I was in marching band in the week prior. She was telling me how excited she was to go and watch me perform at that weekend's football game. Um, she would have been her first time seeing me perform because that was... This man has just discovered that his wife has been murdered. Daddy! Why? What the hell? So, Where's my wife? The window's broken, Dad! But he never suspected his daughter would be the one responsible. What happened? She's dead. I lost two. On March 3rd, 2020, Akron police responded to a 911 call. This is what was waiting for them. She looks like she's been down for a while. There's blood all over the place. There's knife by her head and stuff like that. It's a huge pool of blood. Yeah, 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 yeah. As officers entered the home, they found Brenda Powell on the kitchen floor with 30 stab wounds in her neck. Her daughter, Sydney, was in the house and claimed it was a home invasion that escalated into a brutal murder. Initially, the responding officer didn't think Sydney was involved. However, as time rolled on, the details weren't stacking up. Got you. Come on. Sydney was arrested and charged for the murder of her mother, Brenda Powell. She entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, claiming she had no memory of what happened. The jury didn't believe Sydney, and she was found guilty on two counts of murder, one count of felonious assault, and one count of tampering with evidence. She was sentenced to life in prison with a chance of parole after 15 years.
When the greatest crusader king led just 500 knights and a few thousand foot soldiers against the 20,000 strong host of the great Sultan Saladin, he crushed the invading army and forced Saladin to flee for his life upon a camel. With the 16-year-old king having personally charged into the front lines despite having lost the use of his right arm to leprosy. When he was crowned king of Jerusalem on the 75th anniversary of its capture by the First Crusade, the 13-year-old was already an expert horseman with a keen intellect and a near encyclopedic knowledge of history. But when his tutor had realized that he never reacted to being pinched by his playmates, it had become clear the poor king would never bear the kingdom and heir. And so, in an act of humility, he recognized the Byzantine emperor as his overlord and even tried to give away his crown to the newly come crusader Count Philip of Flanders. But when Philip refused and marched north with his army, the leper king was left to deal with Saladin on his own. But after the 16-year-old king marched out and defeated the sultan's forces at the Battle of Montcassard, all attention turned to who would win the hand of his beautiful sister and inherit the kingdom, leading to bitter infighting among the crusaders. And with Saladin similarly seeking to consolidate his control over Muslim Syria, the two great enemies agreed to a two-year truce. So the sultan secretly sent letters to the Abbasid Caliph promising to unite all Islam and drive the crusaders from the Holy Land for good. Yet after the truce was broken early by a raid from the king's vassal Reynal in 1182, the king ordered him to return all his prisoners, but he refused. And so Saladin marched on the kingdom of Jerusalem with a fresh army, while at the same time in Constantinople, the pro-crusader Byzantine emperor was overthrown, and all the city's Latin inhabitants were slain. Yet now all on his own, outnumbered and so sick he had to be carried into battle, the leper king marched out and defeated the great Saladin's forces once again. But only one year later he became unable to blink and grew blind. And now on his deathbed had no choice but to appoint his sister's husband Guy as his regent. And although Guy was able to hold off another invasion by Saladin, he missed a crucial moment to destroy the enemy army completely. And the sultan was once again allowed to escape. Now filled with fury, the king made a miraculous partial recovery and took command once again. And when Saladin descended upon the castle of Karak, the leper king led out his troops while being carried in a litter and saved his kingdom one last time. But shortly after turning 24, the great king passed away. And with his sister's husband Guy now back on the throne, Saladin marched 40,000 men against 20,000 crusaders at the Battle of Hattin and utterly annihilated their army, pillaging the kingdom and capturing the holy capital of Jerusalem. And despite the best efforts of Richard the Lionheart and later crusaders, the kingdom of Jerusalem would never again regain its former glory. When you're the only man who could have saved the Crusader states from the sword of Saladin, they don't just call you the Leper King, they call you King Baldwin IV. Thanks to a deathbed confession, a nearly 24-year-old cold case was closed this week when the bodies of a missing girl and her mother were found. 10-year-old Natasha Alex Carter and her mother Susan disappeared from their home in Beckley, West Virginia in August 2000. But at first, police initially reported that Alex may have been abducted by her mother. In a press release from December 2021 about the case, the FBI Pittsburgh said, quote, at the time of their disappearance, Susan Carter and Alex's father were having a custody dispute, and Alex moved in with her mother and mother's new husband, which it's not confirmed that it was actually her mother's new husband, but they moved in, and then not long after that, Susan and Alex disappeared. But while it was initially suspected as a parental abduction by Susan, after the two remained missing, an investigation into other possibilities ensued, but unfortunately, the case went cold. In 2021, the FBI reopened the cold case and started looking into the man Susan and Alex were living with, Larry Webb. Searches of his home were done in 2022 and 2023, and they found a bullet embedded in the wall of what was Alex's bedroom. The bullet was tested for DNA, and it confirmed that blood on it belonged to Alex. In October 2023, Larry Webb was indicted on first-degree murder charges for Alex's death, despite Alex and Susan's bodies never being found. Due to his deteriorating health, though, Webb was not arrested until April 12, 2024, but since then, he was being held without bond. On Monday, he had a medical episode, after which, in a, quote, come-to-Jesus moment on his deathbed, he confessed to authorities what he had done. Webb claimed that on August 8, 2000, he had gotten into an argument with Susan over money. He said he was missing some cash and believed that she had taken it and spent it. The argument escalated and he shot her, and then he ended up shooting Alex so there would be no witnesses. Webb then wrapped their bodies in bed linens and placed them in the basement that night. Over the next two nights, he dug a shallow grave in the woods on his property, eventually burying them in his clothes and then walking free for the next 20 years. On April 22, 2024, Larry Webb died at Mount Olive Correctional Complex, and six hours later, Susan and Alex's remains were found at his property in Beckley. Unfortunately, now that Webb is dead, he cannot be charged in connection to their deaths. At least now they have been found and can be properly laid to rest. Alex's father, Rick Lafferty, said after the discovery, quote, It's kind of a sad day, but also a happy day because I can bring my baby home. Rest in peace, Alex and Susan.